Hey everybody, welcome back to Great Northwest Weaponry. This is Thomas, and today we are taking a look at the Carl Gustav's model 1896 Swedish Mauser. Uh, this thing is mm, just, it, it's, it's gorgeous. It works flawlessly. Every, everything about, this is maybe the nicest condition rifle in my entire collection. And uh, they're, they're very interesting. They're one of very few Mauser designs that is actually a cock on close. You can see here, the bolt actually cocks as you close it like an Enfield. So uh, they're based on the Swedish, or no, excuse me, the Spanish Mauser model 1893. And uh, before we get too far into that, we're going to just go ahead and go into the gun room and start talking history. I should start this by noting that we're going to be mentioning a number of rifles that we've never looked at or discussed on the channel up to this point, and we're going to be just kind of glossing over them. So if we ever do get our hands on, namely, the Spanish Mauser Model 1893 and the Remington Rolling Block Model 1867 or 1867-89, we'll cover those more at another time. But... This is the most recent rifle I have acquired. This is uh, another one picked up from my friends at the Warfront, and it's a beauty. I'm I'm really happy with it so far, and it's there's a lot of history that goes into the Swedish Mauser, and with Sweden being uh, a neutral country in World War One when the Swedish Mauser was new on the scene ish. You don't really hear an awful lot about them, uh, and you didn't really hear an awful lot about them until recently with the prevalence of uh, the 6.5 millimeter cartridge uh, finally coming to the fore, uh, namely with the 6.5 Creedmoor. But the sudden rise of 6.5 Creedmoor definitely drew attention to other 6.5 millimeter cartridges, 6.5 by 55 Swede being one of them, which is what this gun is chambered for. So. We'd already briefly mentioned the Remington rolling block. Sweden was looking to replace the uh, aging model 1867 Remington rolling block, uh, originally chambered in 12.7 millimeter black powder cartridge. Uh, they had updated these guns to keep them in service a little longer, I believe in 1889, uh, altering them to the eight millimeter Craig cartridge. Uh, I think it's eight by 58 rimmed. Craig, and they still wanted the, the a new gun though. So in nineteen or eighteen ninety two, uh, trials were started on a new rifle, and there were rifles submitted by Mauser, Craig Jorgensen, and uh, Steyr Monlicker. And in the end, the Mauser won, and initially it was ordered in. 8 millimeter Craig, of which we've mentioned a few times, and I keep on forgetting what it's called. The 8x58 Craig was what the original order was chambered in. After extensive testing, the caliber was reduced to the 6.5 millimeter that we know and love today, and you now have the Model 1894 carbine for the cavalry. This is the ca cavalry that we're talking about at the moment, who's getting their rifles replaced. The Army had already got a new gun a while ago. I don't remember specifically what, but we're going to be kind of skipping over that because this is going to kind of pop in because of the Model 1894. So, Swedish Cavalry adopted the rifle in 1894, and after about two years, the uh, Army must have gotten jealous because they decided they wanted some of their own. There are a few differences, though. The uh, they're, they're fairly minor, but they are existent. So for one, you've got a straight bolt handle on the 1896. You've got a full-length guide rib, you can see right there, uh, just for stability's sake and to prevent binding uh, in the track here. And also, you've got this full-depth thumb cutout that uh, just allows for ease of loading the cartridges. Some of these upgrades to the 1894 are things that you'll see present on a Spanish Mauser, of which some of the design implements are borrowed from. Uh, also, you've got the longer barrel on the 1896. I don't remember the measurement. I'll post it, uh, but this was a bit longer than the cavalry carvings, of course. 
we've already mentioned that this is the caulk on close. You can see that in action right there. And uh, to depress a caulk on close without firing it, uh, when you get to the point where it's going to start actually caulking the caulking piece, you just pull the trigger and slide the rest of the way forward. And now you can just close the bolt and your firing pin is not in the cocked position. Now you're safe to leave it as it is at this point. Some other weird features of this gun. Uh, one that we'll be taking a closer look at when we get to the tabletop is this rear sight is ridiculous. It's the opposite of anything else I've ever seen. Uh, and another that we're going to uh, take a break here in a moment to look at individually is this bayonet. Because this is a really interesting bayonet. It is hollow and it attaches in a way that I've never really seen before. So we're going to go ahead and take a peek at that and then uh, wrap up on the history of this before we go to look at uh, the tabletop close-ups. As I'd already indicated, attaching this thing is kind of different. So you can see it's hollow, it is all steel, and it has this little lug thing here. So let's get the uh, end of the barrel in frame so we can show you how to attach this. So that lug is gonna stick into this little dimple right here. Just slide the hollow bit over, over the cleaning rod, and then you got the barrel ring, and then this little dimple just attaches right there. And now it's on firm. You can pull that out to remove the bayonet comes with a rather nice uh, scabbard and frog, and yeah, managed to find a pretty complete set, and I like it. So now we've reached the point where Sweden has officially adopted for their army the Model 1896. Uh, at this point, they would order about 45,000 from Mauser Orbendorf in Germany. Uh, and this would allow some time for the Swedish state factory, whose name I'm going to try to pronounce, the Carl Gustav Stads Gaffars factory, or something close to that, <laughs> allowing them time to tool up to start making these rifles in-house, so to speak. Um, this would be accomplished in 1898, and you'll start seeing both the 1894 carbine and the 1896 rifle being manufactured here from this point on in the story uh, from 1898 until either 1930 or 32 by the way they'd make some 475,000 of them being by far the biggest manufacturer of them an approximate 535,000 total were made so you know well over three quarters of the uh, total amount of rifles made was made at the Carl Gustavs factory uh, you'd also see them, you know, the, the 45,000 from Germany and uh, Husqvarna also, the same Husqvarna that to this day is making chainsaws. You will see some of these made by them as well, especially later on in their life. And uh, as far as with the Carl Gustav's models, I've seen the date that the production ended uh, stated as both 1930 and 1932. So we can accept that it's in the early 30s that they stopped making them, but the exact date seems to be of some contention. Uh, contention that I'm not going to weigh in on because I've got a sample size of one to discuss here. But even with that, there there's quite a bit that we could, that is telling with this. So this is a 1915 production, and uh, you could call this an early production, though uh, really it's kind of a middle-of-the-road production. But... Uh, Generally, you can kind of gauge whether it's an earlier or later rifle based on the wood at a glance. So this is a walnut stock. You will also see them in elm and beechwood. You will mostly see this uh, later into World War I and after World War I. Though Sweden was neutral in World War I, there did kind of come to be a bit of a, uh, uh, a shortage on French walnut. Uh, at the end of World War One, when you had, you know, every country in the world using walnut in their rifles, pretty much. But, so yeah, the walnut stock actually is part of what drew this to me. Uh, I don't remember if I already mentioned that I picked this up from my friends at the Warfront, but I did. 
And uh, a lot of that had to do with just, just how striking it is. I took a glance at it and was like, ooh, oh, that, that is a fine looking rifle. I would like to have that. And, uh, you know, now I do. <laughs> and I love it. I really do. But, yeah, a couple more little events worthy of note before we go to the tabletop. Uh, this gun did actually, in a couple of instances, possibly see... Uh, kind of it's uh, trial by fire. So uh, your first instance of this would be in late 1939, early 1940, during the Russo-Finnish War, or the Winter War, of which we've discussed several times up to this point. Um, the Finns were chronically short on rifles during this conflict, and they did order a pretty substantial amount of these uh to fill in for the the uh, like second line reserve units, uh, they didn't see an awful lot of frontline service. They were preferred over the Italian Carcano, um, of which speaking of which, that's gonna that'd make for an interesting uh, versus video. But that, that's for another day. Uh, you'd also see a instance where uh, Norwegian troops escaping from Norway after the German occupation were armed with the Model 1896. Uh, they fled to Sweden and were reorganized into police units. Uh, they would later return to their own country after the Germans were booted out. Uh, one, one more uh, thing that they popped up in was a particular event in 1944, of uh, which would then be sent to uh, uh, Denmark for use by the Danish resistance. So the, those ones you're not really going to see much of an indication of if and how they got there, but it is documented that a number of them did go to Denmark and were used by the Danish resistance. Ones by, used by Finland, it's pretty obvious they've got the big old SA stamp on them, and the ones used by the Norwegians, to the best of my understanding, aren't marked as such. And yeah, that's that's about it as far as the travels of this gun. Uh, they stayed in use until 1962. They were replaced by the AK-4, which is an HKG-3 derivative, and they stayed in um, in reserve until the 80s. And at which point they started being liquidated and shipped out to lucky guys like me, who get to enjoy this wonderful rifle and the wonderful. Uh, experience of shooting 6.5, which is a really pleasant cartridge to shoot, and ballistically very similar to 6.5 Creedmoor, which, you know, 6.5 Creedmoor is kind of the wonder cartridge right now. It's I've not seen a cartridge in my lifetime catch on so rapidly, uh, especially after the fact that it had actually been around for a while before it went haywire. But if we ever get a 6.5 Creedmoor rifle, we'll talk about that more. But yeah. Let's go ahead and go to the tabletop and look at some of the smaller details, uh, such as the uh, disc and range card and uh, removal of the bolt. We've only got a couple of things to look at here. For one, we'd already mentioned this very peculiar rear sight. So you adjust it by depressing this and then walking it backward, of which is kind of a pain, really. But you're starting here at your zeroed at, I believe it's 300 meters. Uh, most of these European guns are going to be in meters, not yards. And then you walk it back 400, 500, 600, and then got the volley that goes all the way up to uh, 2,000 meters. So... Yeah, this is basically the reverse of what you'll usually see. Normally, your zero would be here, and you'd go up as you go this way. Now, on the right side, on the rear of the stock, we've got this disc here is uh, an indication of the condition of the barrel, and if the barrel's been modified, which, from what I've understood, the disc uh, having the markings on it that this one has on it means that it was modified for the 6.5 Spitzer, originally it was a flat nose cartridge. And then this is kind of a, a, a conversion chart type range chart looking 
thing. <laughs> I've, I've been kind of confused by these. I've seen these in a few different variations, but uh, if you know more about the exact use of this, uh, feel free to comment. I would love to know a little more, but from my understanding, you basically got barrel condition and range conversion chart. Last thing to look at is the bolt extraction, which is a piece of cake. Just pop it open, pull on that little lever, and it comes free. Just like, you know, most Mausers. Put it back in, just... You can just push it straight in, or you can pull this out to make it a little easier on yourself. Uh, the ramp does stop the bolt, so you have to depress the ramp to push the bolt forward. Yeah, that's all she wrote. Let's go take another five shots through this thing. So loading this is nothing special at all. It's uh, really just standard for Mauser. You open the bolt, take your stripper clip, five rounds, put it in this, this cut right here, and push in with your thumb. And it's got a nice cut for your thumb, and I think that contributes to how smoothly this thing feeds. I actually hadn't really noticed that until today just how deep that cut is but you can push all the way down to the magazine with your thumb flat so it's really nice you can close the bolt over the bullets on this one but we're not going to because we're going to just fire this five safety is your three position wing style safety so safe with the ability to manipulate the bolt safe without the ability to manip manipulate the bolt and fire and as we'd already mentioned at the beginning, this is a cock on close, like an Enfield, which uh, pretty roundly is considered to be a faster bolt, but the cock on open is a stronger design generally, though these Swedish Mausers are often put in the upper echelon of Mauser rifles of that era. And I'm kind of loosely using the term Mauser, even though this is a Mauser design, but regardless, we've gone over that already, so let's go ahead and shoot this thing some more. Oh, it's just so nice. One miss, and I was getting a little cocky. So uh, I feel good about this gun. I, I would love to hunt with this thing. Uh, again, as we've discussed, 6.5 Swede is a uh, pretty roundly a pra or praised bullet. Uh, it's ballistically fairly similar to 6.5 Creedmoor and is considered like an ideal deer hunting cartridge. We will be taking this gun out to do more stuff, maybe some comparisons with other guns of the era. Most especially, I'd like to see how 6.5 Swede compares ballistically to 6.5 Japanese. But that's stuff for another day. Meanwhile, hope you all enjoyed this video. It's been Thomas of Great Northwest Weaponry, and I will see you next time.